uh, we already have uh, John sir uh, in the waiting room. We will we will we will have in uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but as we are going forward, Lanea, uh, do we have uh, any uh, any housekeeping notes or something that our audience needs to listen to? Yes, just a just a quick note. Um, hopefully, you can see my screen right now. I just wanted to share with you guys that I know. Um, not everyone who is here can maybe stay for the entire afternoon as much as we would love you to. So I just wanted to let you know that we do have our event page here where you can check out uh, the agenda for today and when what speakers are speaking when. So if you don't know what's up next and you're trying to plan your afternoon, that's available to you. Um, and I also wanted to show you um, a new initiative that we're, uh, we just kicked off really recently. Um, and this is our tonight show for industrial design thinking. So uh, as we mentioned, um, especially during this time, it's really important for us to stay connected. And this is just a free form hour um, all about industrial design thinking, um, about the industrial design process, and inspirational bites of wisdom um, just to help us as a community keep up our opti optimism and, and uh, innovation and urge uh, to keep our minds sharp together. So Zivek is the host for that. He did an amazing job last time. Um, and I will post the link for that in the chat box um, for you to sign up. So uh, don't miss out on that either. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Lene, for saying I did an amazing job for that. So I'm, I'm so happy now. That brings me a big smile on my face uh, as such. So we have uh, John right here. Uh, we will start in one or two minutes as such. I think I'm asking uh, everybody uh, uh, what, what, how are you feeling right now uh, and maybe what you are what is one or two things that you are learning yourself? And I will keep on asking that uh, for, for every speaker. But I think I also owe the answer to it in this, in this between elements. So one of the things that I'm trying to uh, hard to grapple is, and some of you, uh, it might be difficult for this uh, to understand. Uh, I, I, I commute uh, means in normal pre-COVID time, uh, my everyday commute is two hours. So one hour one way, one hour the other way. It's pretty long, but I love where I work. I love where I live. So I somehow had made peace uh, with that. And I had planned plenty of things for that commuting time. Uh, 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 and also uh, the other things like when I want to do some rehearsals, maybe a speech rehearsal or something when I want to go out uh, and do, I used to do that during my, uh, my fitness time. Like if I, I, I go and do fitness boxing. So for that hour or hour and a half over there, I use that just literally to channel out and just think about what needs to happen in that particular world. Somehow, you know, when throughout the day, your mind gets filled with cobwebs or you get fuzzy with plenty of things attacking, uh, attack you. Of all the things I find myself when I'm actually doing uh, some uh, fitness uh, or some exercise, that's when I try to expand and think uh, creatively. Somehow I'm, I'm, I'm missing that. Uh, both that kind of an, uh, time in the car, jamming to loud music and just trying to sing. Imagine me singing with my voice and my accent, but I could do that in a car. I would not harm anybody else, not even my kids, uh, in that kind of cacophony. But uh, some elements I still miss, not just commute, but the time uh, over there, it will be hard right now in the house to blast music and try to uh, sing uh, as I used to sing. Uh, and the time when uh, I, I think about the things to just clear the cobwebs and think clearly for the next proposal or for the next speech or something like that. So that was one other thing I just wanted to uh, take off my chest. Uh, as we see, we have uh, John, uh, John over here. Uh, John, uh, you can unmute and say hello. Hi, everybody. Awesome, awesome. And, uh, and most of you uh, know John. I will just introduce him uh, in a couple of elements and then we'll go forward. Uh, John is right now uh, uh, with Hyundai. Uh, he's the founder uh, and the, and the uh, director at Hyundai Cradle. Uh, it's an amazing element and I would let uh, John talk more about it. But John is uh, an amazing engineer. He's a quintessential doctor from Stanford, uh, but he's a truly humble person and an amazing enlightened mode to look at design, look at engineering look at the way we have to uh, look at good design uh, perspectives as such. So I'm, I'm really uh, honored and humbled uh, for you uh, putting some time uh, to join on our virtual design conversations. And I just love your background too. I means I am the only <laughs> one in this artificial world. Uh, today it's, it's actually yeah. outside. I, I, could, I could have jumped outside, but that's an amazing background. Where are you right now? So I'm calling in from my backyard. Uh, behind me is a uh, grape, grapevine. Uh, it's not that long, actually. It's maybe only eight feet wide, uh, but yeah, it 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 sprouts pretty prolifically around this time of year. 
And so, so around uh, uh, late summer, we get some grapes. Yeah, and, and you are in fact now Silicon Valley, right? So uh, where you That's are. That's right, yeah. in Palo Alto, right. In the, in yeah. the real valley, and you actually can <laughs> harvest grapes from it. That's pretty impressive. Because <laughs> yeah. this, uh, this, this part of the house is a um, south, southwest facing wall, so it gets really intense sun. So we actually did it to partly cool the house a bit, but also gets intense sun. Um, so which is really great for grapes, right? And then what happens is it's intense sun and it gets cool at night. And so we get pretty, you know, every other year we'll get really good grapes. So this, this year we should have a good harvest. And have you tried any wine making with your homegrown grapes? Uh, no, I'm not, 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 not yet. I don't have, the house is too small for that kind of thing, but, but uh, not yet. <laughs> Do you also have a vegetable garden or something along with the grapes? Yeah, we have uh, a few patches here and there where we grow some, some uh, see, we just planted some tomatoes and uh, green onions and uh, some um, other herbs as well. Awesome. Yeah. So, I, I think uh, I will, uh, we will start eventually uh, with the topics that we have in mind. But just uh, help us understand, uh, tell us about, about yourself, your, your personality. What do you do for fun right now in this world? How are you creating or keeping yourself busy? Apart from work, in, in, your, in your personal passion points. Yeah, so, so I, uh, I, I grew up in southeastern Michigan, in fact. I still have family in West Bloomfield, and um, my dad lives um, part of the time in, in Farmington Hills, and uh, he goes to Korea um, too. But, but you know, I grew up there. My, my childhood was in southeastern Michigan. Uh, I, I went to Farmington High, for anybody who's familiar with that high school, and then I went to uh, um, Kettering, formerly known as GMI, up in Flint. And then when I graduated from Kettering, I came out to California. Yeah. So engineer by training, uh, but living in, in Silicon Valley since, um, I guess for 30 years now at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that I figured, yeah, the, the whole pandemic is affecting people in different ways. I, I'm fortunate in a lot of ways to not be as uh, impacted in a lot of ways. One is, uh, you know, mostly knowledge work. So Theoretically, you can do that work anywhere. You don't have to be in the office to do that. It's convenient to be there. There's, there's a lot of things that facilitate that work. Um, but I could, a lot of work I do, I can sit in front of my computer, basically. Um, so that hasn't been that much of an impact. Um, I suppose if we didn't have internet for some reason, then I would be panicking at this moment. All will be. You know, no one would be having this call, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I enjoy um, uh, the outdoors uh, to some degree. So, so fortunately, they're, they're still encouraging, right, everybody to get out and do exercise thing. So I, I do that. Just walking around the neighborhood and the weather's beautiful this time of year. So I've been enjoying that. I enjoy uh, science fiction a lot. Um, I devour every kind of... Uh, science fiction that, that I can, mostly viewing, but sometimes reading as well. Um, and uh, of course, it's, so there's lots to, to watch on, on, on uh, TV, I guess, in that regard. And then just, you know, try to stay healthy, uh, eating, eating right, sleeping a lot. Sorry, go ahead. Pardon me? Do you also write anything uh, about science fiction or futuristic fiction? Uh, you, what was the question again? Read? Apart from reading, do you write about science fiction? No, no, I, I, I'm, I, I don't write. I'm um, one. Well, I guess one, why I became an engineer is because I knew I was not good at writing from a, a literary. So I said, you know, I should become an engineer. Otherwise, yeah, I might have been, been an author <laughs> or a writer. No, uh, <laughs> no, you, you would, you would, you would do uh, fantastically well over there. The thing is, yeah. people, uh, I have been talking with um, uh, with many uh, distinguished speakers like you. Many people are trying to, they always thought that I have to do this, I had to do that, and the only reason was I, never, I don't have time. And some people are trying to uh, look at their bucket list, which can be done in-house. It might be reading or writing. I'm trying to uh, uh, delve a little bit into writing. Uh, I have not yet performed uh, any, 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 anything big volumes. It will be small articles as such, but I'm trying to uh, find out uh, those elements. So from that perspective, I think as we all have a little bit extra time to look out of the window and contemplate on things. Have you found something new about yourself in the last five weeks of uh, quarantine? Uh, I, maybe nothing new about myself per se, though in that spirit though, yeah, I, I have been um, thinking a lot about um, gravity. And I actually will have, I prepared some slides today about why 
I'm so fascinated about gravity. Awesome. And, and and so um, I've I've been enjoying this intersection, um, and it just kind of maybe lead into what I'm talking about is between science, art, and technology. Um, and I've been reading, um, you know, popular books about gravity and quantum gravity and so on for little, I guess the last six months or so. Um, been thinking about it more, right? And as you said, right, you have a little more time to think about these things. So I think without this extra time, I probably might be thinking about, but not, not as much, but I've definitely been thinking about gravity a lot more these days. That's, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I think there are two things in the world uh, that we cannot escape. Uh, one yeah. is gravity and the other thing is, I actually made a speech about this. One is gravity and the other thing is the pull of design. Uh, yeah. The emotional perspectives uh, that attach with every object, right? Means uh, talking about gravity or any other science fiction, let's say, uh, let's say interstellar, right? Means yeah, yeah, exactly. He is floating out near a wormhole, and no matter what, you're physically there is a huge separation in the vastness of space and the eternity of time. But still, mentally, you're hooked back to Mother Earth with your daughter's uh, image or what yeah. they are doing or what they are not. So even though we are distance in this, let's say, uh, uh, in more than uh, I would say light years, that fact of attachment with something once the bond is there. Uh, now, it might be love or hate, both of them. It will always <laughs> be there. Well, that, that's pretty interesting. So, uh, without further ado, yeah. uh, do you want to uh, share the screens and let's go through uh, the sure. Hopefully this works. Of art and technology, uh, and then we can again come back to Q&A. Okay, hopefully it's coming up. Yeah, I can see it. We can you see, can it. see it. Okay, awesome. Great. So, um, yeah, t t the title is, as you can see, it's Art and Technology, uh, STEM to Stream. And uh, as you know, STEM is really science, technology, engineering, and math, and it's been an initiative to promote more science, more technology, more math education uh, with, with kids. And, and, and there's been some derivatives, and the latest one I've seen is Stream, which is adding uh, reading and writing, or, or you know, basically literary liter literacy, right? Um, the reading part, the writing part is where I'm, I'm weak at, right? And then, and then arts. And now I think arts is just broadly speaking, right? It, it's uh, performing arts, fine arts, um, acting, singing, and, and so on. So I think it's, it's very broad, right? And so we they put it all together. It's a fairly broad topic. So, so um, this particular talk, I'm going to be meandering a bit, but I will hopefully try to make sense and do honor to the title that I put together for for you today <clears throat> all right so uh um let's see can you see that okay the uh, uh hopefully yeah hopefully you see that okay so what this is is a um hold on a second i'm going to actually switch to another uh um yeah. Yeah. uh let's see if it's uh so by the way, as you're bringing that up uh, for the audience, means uh, John, sir, uh, apart from being uh, uh, with Hyundai Cradle, he also is an, an advisory board, him and Hyundai, uh, on the LAC, MAs, art and technologies uh, kind of an element. So I think that's why we are talking about art yeah. in the world of uh, mobility eventually. Okay, so um, I, I will talk about what I'm doing uh, at, at Cradle. So I've, um, I'll, you know, I've been working with Sunbrook for our, and and uh, um, shameless plug. It, it's a Sunbrook Fire is awesome. It, it, they they've got a great team. Uh, I met G back at a conference, SA conference. I don't know, five six years ago at this point, and he just came up to me after I was on a panel. We talked, and I visited, and the rest is, is history. Thank you. And and uh, what we uh, among the things we worked on is this vehicle, concept vehicle here, which we call Elevate, and it's an exploded view. And so what you see here is a, um, an electric vehicle that is on a you know, skateboard, uh, with, so that's not necessarily anything new, but it's a skateboard vehicle in which you have legs, uh, or uh, uh, legs attached to the wheels. And this enables this vehicle to walk uh, like a quadruped. And then you have a modular approach so the body can detach and be swapped out with another vehicle. The, the, one of the things I, I really appreciated with uh, uh, Sunbrook Farrar is, is um, this picture here and, and, and it's showing um, 
it, in, this in context. And it, there's, a, there's certainly this technical aspect to this vehicle, which is very important, of course, but there's an aesthetic that really pops out, right? And this picture is, almost tells a, a great story in and of itself, right? And so the vehicle can go into a rubble field for rescue or for search or for medical assistance in times of disasters or, or other situation. And it's just the overall quality that um, goes along with marrying the technical with the visual and making this picture possible. And, and uh, as you can see, the, the quality, the color, um, and, and the big all, all shaped on reality, but it is more than that too. And so this is why I, I just kind of bring in this idea of art, right, and, and design into technology is important because it just want to make it connect, not not just be form and function, but this is a connection to, to to people. And and this next picture here is is one of the our hero shots, right? It's the vehicle going over or uh, cresting the summit of a hill. Uh, using the walking modes and just something about it this you know even for me even now really I just like wow that, that's a really cool thing uh, and and it keeps me awake at night and uh, motivated to, to keep on working despite all the challenges uh, that, that, that we face in this project all right so um, let me move on to us this is a this is a uh, kind of a sneak peek I don't I'm not telling too much about this because it's still work in progress it's the current project that we have right now. All, all I can say is that it's a smaller version of what you just saw. Um, as you can tell, it is, uh, well, as you may, may not tell, but it's, it's meant for um, uh, more robotic vehicle. It's an unmanned version of what you just saw. And so we're working on this right now. It's still hot and active, and we'll find a time to talk more about this uh, later on. I'm very, very excited about that, this project. All right, um, moving on now to um, my work uh, and some of the things I'm doing with, with LACMA, uh, LA County Museum of Art, and they have a program called the Art and Technology Lab. Uh, about six, five, five years ago, Hyundai Motor Company um, sponsored several museums uh, for, for different programs. And at LACMA, eight Hyundai Motor Company sponsored the Art and Technology Lab. And then I was invited to be the Hyundai um, representative on their uh, corporate uh, advisory uh, committee. And I was super happy to do this. I was a bit intimidated at first because I, you know, as I was mentioning, I was more, more uh, adept at math and science. I shunned art. I can't draw worth anything except for stick figures. And I can't write, <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, uh, sure, this sounds great. At least I can bring in the technology part of it, right? And that's like, they're like, yeah, that's great. I said, okay, cool. And and you know, it's uh, I just want to say it's been a blast. It's been really fun. I've um, gotten a better appreciation for what is art and really the connection between between the two. And what I want to do now is just share with you. A, 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 maybe a briefly about one of the projects that, that we were heavily involved with. This is Jonathan Keats. Um, he is demoing a project which we call the, the uh, Rotable Synapse. The Rotable Synapse was the name of the project. And we worked, uh, I worked with him, Jonathan Keats. And he's, uh, Jonathan Keats is um, known as um, experimental or experiential artist. He has a wiki page, actually, so if you want to learn more about Jonathan Keats, um, he, can, he has a wiki page. And what you see here is a, is a demo that we're doing of the rotable synapse. And what it was, was the uh, notion that if you can combine some of the car sensors, you know, RPM, speed, um, um, we, we, and other information that you can convert that into a more visceral experience for the passengers or the driver, right? Because because cars today are uh, isolating, right? For and, and there's a lot of benefits to that, of course, right? As Jeepak was just saying, you can sing, you can meditate, you can think, you can have conference calls and so on because it's so isolating, right? And and the more expensive the car, the more isolating it can be. Well, well to a certain degree, because if you have a sports car, then it's very connecting but in any case the idea is that the car can be more connecting to the to on, on a visceral 
level, right? So the gut, literally a gut level. In this case, we were playing with audio based upon RPM and speed. So depending upon, I think RPM was pitch and speed was um, um, tempo. So we could, we could change both independently and it made for a kind of a crazy audio experience. And the, the te technology part is shown here. We literally hacked together stuff. We didn't really, really couldn't get into the CAN bus. So we, you know, took uh, anemometers to, to measure speed. We actually used two anemometers because we wanted to know if there was a difference between left side, right side speed, you know, if cars were passing, if you're stationary or whatever, um, hooked in the connected to the audio system and people could play music, but then they would, again, alter according to your speed and your RPM uh, and, and, and so on. So it was a lot of fun, right? It was, uh, um, and then we had a, as a previous picture, had a, had a show at LACMA and it was, it was a lot of fun. So that was the first project that we did uh, and only a project so far that we did with, with, with LACMA. So, so I think um, before I go to the next slide, what I wanted to, I, I guess that what I've, for me personally, I've been, I've been uh, changing in like my view of what art can be, right? Because uh, before it's like, well, it's painting, it's sculpture, it's beautiful stuff like that, that I can never do. But uh, this is like, oh yeah, I can think about art in a different way, right? Among the other things that they have at, at Lockmore or any other art museum. So one of the things I've been uh, regarding like COVID-19 and the pandemic, it, there's been a number of things which in a way is like art for real. So let me try to explain. So this picture here is one of many that you might find in uh, how air quality uh, has drastically improved. And I like the way they did this particular photograph. It's kind of one shot, but you know, two different times, of course. Yeah. And instead of doing a before after, it's, it's sort of one scene, but then they kind of divide it in half. So you can see on the left-hand side, it's the you know, regular uh, normal life, if you will. And then the uh, right-hand side is you know, due to the reduction in car use and industrial output and so on. And so, what we have here is this uh, juxtaposition in this way, but it, 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 it's a kind of, we're living in a kind of reality that's unreal, right? It, 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 it's familiar and yet so different at the same time, right? And, and that to me, that's, that's kind of like art. Art, art kind of does that to us. That sometimes when you see art, it's like, well, that looks familiar, but it's kind of weird, right? Like Picasso or whatever. It's like, I can kind of see it, but I can't kind of see it at the same time. And it's, I think, for me, it's a, as horrible as it could be for, for, for is for many, I, I do think it, it if you, if when I pause and think about it, it's somewhat interesting from our, from our view that we are living in art right now, right? And then when I saw this picture, it reminded me of a uh, painting restaurant. Um, I wonder if I say this, let's see. Okay, I missed, there was another painting I, I missed, but um, um, it, it's sort of like, um, uh, paint restoration, right? We see paint restoration, uh, painting restoration, it, it does the same thing. Where, where on the one hand, the unrestored is the real original, and then the restored one is somewhat more beautiful in a way, but altered and different too, right? And then the, finally, there's also this picture here, which I found is interesting. You see a gentleman with himself holding it to his face and he has you know his current self the new self right and so i think um we see this in art but we see it in reality now and i think what, I, what i'm appreciating is that there's things to be to appreciate certainly as difficult as now to to think about the life we live is i don't know i think if you, you can see it from different eyes right it, it, there, there's certain there's certain kind of a um odd beauty about life life today right and when we get back to the normal whatever that is i think it'll be another juxtaposition that that could be cause for the thought all right so i'm going to switch gears and uh i will um talk about um as um Giebach, you know i was asking earlier what did i learn about myself and maybe not learning about myself but i was mentioning gravity and i've been really thinking about gravity a lot um, and I'll try to explain <laughs> the best I can. Uh, and the word playground um, is, uh, the, the, the both words I want to emphasize. So this idea of a playground, right, um, is 
just that for play is oftentimes mostly for, for kids. But the playgrounds that we've experienced as kids, I think taught us a lot about gravity and specifically Newtonian mechanics without teaching us, without showing us any of the horrible equations that, that go with it, right? And so let me try to explain. Um, oh, and then, um, uh, oh shoot, this, this presentation is not having all of my slides, but um, hmm, let me just do a quick, quick check here. Um, but let me, okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just hold it here for, for just for a second. So, so what I wanted to do here was to say things like, if you think about uh, slides, uh, I mean, the swings, uh, seesaws, and merry-go-rounds, right? So with the merry-go-round, you basically experience what is centripetal and centrifugal forces, right? So in, in, as a car designer or a car engineer, you care a lot about that, right? You care a lot about the ability to, to you know, hang into a curve or, or oversteer, understeer, those kind of issues. With seesaws, it's fun, especially when you jump off the end and your, your friend goes, hits his butt on the ground. But you learn things like levers and forces and, and leverage. So you think learns like pliers or tongs or wheelbarrows, right? They're all great examples of different types of levers that, that are in principle, you, you can learn that from, from a seesaw. And then swings, right? And when you do a swing, uh, you learn about conservation of, of energy, right? So between uh, potential and kinetic energy in particular, right? And then you can represent that by a graph. I guess, but, but, but you can tell a kid to get in the swing and swing, and then they're literally feeling what is the trade-off between kinetic and potential energy without showing them any equation, right? They kind of get that inherently. And so I think that's what a playground can be like. And that's why I moved into this idea of a new, um, uh, I mentioned the Newtonian gravity uh, playground. But then I got to thinking about Gravity more, more particularly, and then one of the things you might see in a, in a museum is something like this, and this is called the gravity well, right? And so you have this uh, funnel, like apparatus, there's marbles or coins, uh, you can whip them around and they kind of swirl, and it's supposed, to, so it's supposed to represent what is a gravity well. And I think what I, it, it's, what I like about it, it's simple, and then you can kind of cause you to think about what is gravity and so on. But the thing that kind of bothers me is that it's not totally like there's still there's still some aspects of it which are uh, confusing. I say because so so in a gravity well, uh, the other thing that happens in a gravity well is time slows down the further you go, right? And so at the top of the well, speed time is running at one rate, and then further down, time is uh, another rate. And so how do you represent the warpage of not only space but time? or space time, right? And so as much as this is fun, I think it, it's fitting with, with what I'm thinking about. It, it, there's still some parts of it that, that can, are confusing to me and I wish, you know, I'm kind of inspired to think about what could be different. And, and so in reality, this is sort of what, um, it just, this is a little small spaceship, but when you see space time, it warps something like this. It's not just a, a funnel, right? It's sort of this shrinkage of space time around, in this case, the Earth, right? And this happens with any, anything, right? Anything that has gravity is warping space time around it in this three dimensional way that isn't not typically represented in the things that we see on even movies or, or in, in the different, different apparatus. And the other thing that, um, uh, another, another concept uh, is, is wormholes, right? Wormholes are these structures that are in theory possible. And when you see a wormhole in, in the movies or in art like this, it's a hole, right? And it kind of makes sense because it's like, well, you called it a wormhole. So a hole is a hole. <laughs> and like, yeah, but it turns out, um, uh, and I didn't really think about it, honestly, when until I saw the movie Interstellar. And I hope I have in this presentation. Uh, well, let me just uh, briefly, uh, this diagram here, which I think is really helpful. What is a wormhole, right? So if you, uh, in this case, take like a strip of paper and you uh, fold it over and you create a, 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 a funnel, if you will, a tunnel uh, between point A and point B, then that is called the wormhole. And the advantage of a wormhole in theory is that you can 
go from point A to point B much faster from than in regular space time. And the reason is because your, your distance is you're truncated by this hole that is created between um, the two. And, and, and so in a two dimensional world, sheet of paper, a hole is a circle, right? And, and so that, that makes sense. And so, and this two dimensional piece of paper exists in a world of three dimensions. Although in that world of 2D, it's, that's all they can experience is the 2D world but it, it is existing within a 3D uh, environment. And so, uh, gosh, I hope this is the next, right? so, okay, great. So it's a little bit dark, but if you saw the movie Interstellar, and I highly recommend it, um, it, it, it this is the wormhole. And, and then the character, he goes, it's a sphere. And then the other guy goes, well, what did you, what did you expect, the hole? And, and the guy, he goes, yeah. He goes, and he, he just did, and then the one character did the illustration of the folding paper and all that stuff. Goes well if if a if a in a two D world a sphere you know a hole is a circle what's a hole in the three D world is a sphere right so in in our world if we were to see a wormhole it would appear as a sphere not as a like a rabbit hole and I thought that's mind blowing because I've never seen a spherical hole before right and that would be the thing to try to, well, the challenge that I was like, how do you, how could you represent this in the real world? How could you tell somebody that uh, a wormhole in our world will appear as a sphere? And uh, here's another picture that I also like. It's, it's not from the movie, but I think it kind of depicts what a wormhole could look like. It looks like a planet in, in, in some ways, right? It's really, really pretty. Uh, and I'm, I should show it because it's a really pretty picture. But, but here's, here's um, a possibility, a glimpse of what a wormhole could be in our world. It would basically these are crisp glass spheres, right? And you hold them up and you could see, um, in this case, let's say you're in the desert, right? Um, and the wormhole could be peering into a city scene in some other part of the world and vice versa. If I'm in that city scene, I'm looking into the, the sphere and I see, um, um, this desert scene, right? And so that's, that's, I think, what the experience could be like. And, and that's the thing that I would be ch challenging myself is, or in asking others, how, how could we create an, a, 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 a wormhole in, that people can see, right? That, that, uh, that's not kind of like these spheres, but a little bit different because like a wormhole, if I'm going to go on the back side of the wormhole, I'm going to see my world, right? But if I go to the front side, I'm going to see the other world, right? And so the, the, the thing that I, I'm trying to figure out is how do you actually can show that to somebody that this is what a wormhole could be like, right? I just think it'd be a lot of fun, right? To, to cause people to think about, oh, that's the wormhole, right? That's what it looks like, okay? And, and so on. Okay. And, uh, so cool. and that, and then, and, then, uh, and then, of course, keep going on to the movie Interstellar, which, as I mentioned, I like science fiction. This is a scene from it. This is the black hole called Gargantua. And uh, um, the, the physics, um, um, what they did was they took the physics of, uh, uh, from Kip Thorne, a, a professor at Caltech, um, who, who um, recently won the Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize in Physics. And he, took the, he wrote equations those equations were used by the film studio to the the to create the the, gen, the graphics that you see here right so this is a scientifically accurate representation of a of a spinning black hole right and so i'm like wow that's first of all it's beautiful so i mean to me and then it's 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 that it's based upon science and math right and i think it's also really cool and again this connection between science math you know, entering art and, and so on. And they did another, here's another shot, which I love. This is towards the end of the movie where the spacecraft is, uh, you know, getting sucked, not sucked in, but drawn into the gravity well. And it needs to accelerate to get out of the gravity well uh, to, otherwise they'll, they'll plunge into the black hole, which two of the characters do end up going into the black hole, right? So let me, uh, let me, uh, uh, move on though to to another topic related topic though and that is not what was interesting is that movie came out in 2014 I think it was and then in 2015 uh, we detected 
uh, gravitational waves from collapsing or colliding black holes. Uh, and uh, and the depicted something like this. And this, uh, this depiction though is a common depiction, but again, it's, it, it's uh, intuitive, right? It's like a sheet that you're, or like a waves of a surface that, that are rippling, but it's inaccurate because it's just 2D, right? There, there's something uh, simple about it, but it's also confusing because gravity waves are not, are like water waves, but are also not like, water waves. They're more like audio waves, I, I guess, right? And so, um, uh, so recently, um, one of the research centers looking at these data came up with this picture, and it's beautiful, right? This is a, this is taking data from the, the data from an observatory called LIGO uh, that, that recorded these gravity waves and came up with this picture. And they actually came up with a movie uh, they, they released it just like 10 days ago. Highly recommend it. It's, it's just stunning, right? It, it's, it looks, um, it's called, um, if you type in GW190412 collapsing black hole, you, you should see uh, a link to a movie like this. Right? Uh, and of course, those big circles, small circles, the black holes, right? And it's making this beautiful picture, right? But it's data, it's science, it's, you know, uh, based on uh, these observatories. And it's just really just fascinating to me. And so these are other pictures that were generated by the same research institution of, of the data from a variety of gravitational wave observations. Wow. Um, and it's like, if I didn't know it was scientific data, I think it'd be, you know, some really great CG art, right? And I would really appreciate seeing something like this in an art museum. Um, and, and perhaps they took some liberties in the colorizations, although I do believe they use data to support, but you, what you see is this fascinating, very complex interaction. Uh, basically what you're seeing is a warpage of space time. And space time is warping in a very complex, weird, fascinating, awesome, fearful way, right? I mean, this is, and, and space-time, by the way, is the stiffest known, quote-unquote, material known to, to man. It is on the order if, so if you take like rubber versus diamond, I think as something like, I don't know, eight orders of magnitude more stiff. Diamond is like eight times more stiff, 10 to the eighth or 10 to 10, you know, more stiff than, than rubber, right? So it's huge, right? But space time is 10 to 20 times more stiff than diamond. So space time is a really stiff material. But of course, to me, that's completely not intuitive because I move freely through space. How, if it's so stiff, then why is it so easy for me to move around, right? I don't know. But the fact is, it's so stiff that it takes the energy of a collapsing black hole to make it wiggle, right? Um, and the amount of energy released by the black hole was uh, basically one mass of one of our sun completely obliterated within a microsecond or something like that, right? A millisecond. That's how much energy is if the Earth, you know, E equals mc squared. So if I, if I obliterate all that mass to energy, how much energy is that? Turns out it's uh, uh, like 20 times all the stars and the universe is energy, right? You take all the stars and all the energy they produce, and you times it by 20, that's how much energy was released. So it's a, it's a gigantic amount of energy, completely invisible, except the gravi gravity waves, right? And so you and I were squeezed and pushed and pulled very briefly, very minutely for, for, for a moment. And these are some of the pictures that show us the patterns of gravity that, that result in that. Wow. So I think, it, oh, that's unfortunately the last slide. Um, I had a, um, just a couple more. And so I, I guess I'll end, these are good slides to end with here. And that, that, what I wanted to say is um, there, there is um, the reason I call it a, you know, coming up with a gravity playground um, and, and come up with an Einsteinian gravity playground or, or general relatively gravity playground is because just as 
when you and I went on swings and slides and merry-go-rounds and roller coaster rides, we all, in, we literally felt Newtonian physics. Yeah. So if you took a class in physics, you said, oh, that's what, that's potential energy, that's kinetic. Oh, okay, that's conservation of momentum. This is centripetal force. This is whatever, right? And so it helped me in those classes because I had a literally an intuitive feel for what those equations were about. What I want to challenge, create is a playground that kids can play in to experience general relativity, right? And so that when they grow up, they'll be able to uh, create those, you know, with the new findings that we're finding about gravity from these observations, maybe new, 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 new technologies, new solutions that can help us, you know, I don't know, with whatever problem we're going to have 50 years from now, right, or later on, because they had a much, they have an intuitive sense of what general relativity is, they, they can appreciate and maybe get inspired by those things, because they had fun, right, and, and they maybe they want to learn more, not everybody, but somebody, right, and, and I think that's this notion of a playground, there's going to be various apparatus in a playground that kids can experience these concepts of space-time, space-time warpage, gravity waves, black holes, wormholes, uh, and so on, right? And so that's what I've been thinking about during COVID-19, yes. <laughs> uh, in addition to my day job. So I am actually trying to think of how to do this. Um, I don't, know if the, I don't know if it can be as robust as a playground equipment, so it may, may have to be indoors, but nonetheless, that's what I'm thinking about. So, so thank you um, for that, and Giovac, I'll, uh, I'll quit sharing my screen, and then I'll turn it over to you. No, 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 that's fascinating, John. It's, uh, it's a completely different way. I, mean, I, was, I was pretty proud of myself. I'm just reading books about fitness and a little bit about design and about, about, about health and all those things. You are... You are literally going down, uh, down a very deep. <laughs> really is a wormhole to think about this. I am. Yeah. I should. I'm not wearing a hat, but maybe I should wear a hat and maybe tip my hat at you. That's, that's, that's right. I, I, I was scared to ask you questions. I'm now really scared to ask you questions. Like you know, what <laughs> you during COVID-19, I was just contemplating about gravity and its role in our our. That's that's pretty impressive and. But I, but I enjoy that element because uh, maybe next time you might have seen this, but next time you are back in the Detroit area, uh, we have an amazing museum called uh, the Henry Ford. And they actually uh, just last to last year uh, uh, brought the uh, Charles and Eames uh, exhibition on, it was, it's called Mathematica. So this was done 57 uh, years ago, I think in 1964. Wow. A little bit less years than okay. that. To explain to an average school kid who has no indication of what is a multiplication, what is division, what is what is hyperbole, what is parabole. And they actually went to universal designers and said, how would you help visualize yeah. through some play element and apparatus where they can actually see algebra and arithmetic happen. And I mean, I'm an industrial designer. I did my business school also. Before that, I was a mechanical engineer and I thought I knew my basics. But the way you look at that and say like, bang, that's what hyperbola is. And it just now etches in a completely different way to understand those, those fundamentals of mathematics. And, uh, and I hope I'm not yeah, wrong. That, that, that's, exactly, that, that's exactly the kind of thing, right? It's like, yeah. wow, right? And it takes that kind of creativity, right? And engineering and math and, and put it together to make it fun, right? And that's, yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah. And the element yeah. You're, you are creating is, I think uh, Owen, uh, in our first element, he said, sometimes we humans make things too complicated. And some of the elements to understand gravity means, yeah, you, you have something, you drop it. Oh, I caught my mouse. <laughs> you, you always say you drop it. You never say you release it. It's not going to go up. Some things you just know, but we make it too complex for us to understand. Uh, centripetal force, centrifugal force. The way you mentioned about the wormhole, right, means, in the movie, uh, Monsters, Inc., they had those doors. You go in and out and you see completely different two realms. That's pretty interesting too. But I hope a playground like this, uh, I don't know in what incarnation, but this is pretty amazing to see because 
I I am still an industrial designer, but I I do not know if you know. I still try to amuse myself by uh, reading <laughs> astrophysics and astronomy. Also, what That's you talk great. about wormholes and black holes and uh, the gravitational uh, uh, waves that the LIDO uh, saw it in the first element of their testing. Uh, they caught the first gravitational wave, and yeah. were, it was like un- amazing to see that. I think it was just a rack of beer or something that he went to get in and he had left the instruments on and they detected it. But the way you can use it uh, and involve art in it to let people know that black hole is not just black, means even they say dark energy. It's not dark. It's just we do not know it. That's why we are calling it dark energy or dark matter. But the elements that you mentioned, gravitation, means uh, about the, the typical misconceptions of what a black hole is, right? Black holes don't just speed in the space gobbling up mass no it's where it is no. once you go yeah. beyond the accretion disk then you might be fooled for it and then the spaghettification happens but if we can see it as you say in a playground like what is we understand spaghetti we understand let's say spaghettification but if you can somehow in a in a safe way experience those elements of time dilation we know somebody right. goes to space and comes back uh, he will be or she will be younger than us but if you see that if you understand that, that, that's pretty amazing. Means I do not know how how are you finding mechanisms to make this playground happen. Uh, I, if you want, I can connect you with uh, Michael Laris. He actually is the VP of Global Innovation at a playground making company. I do not know if they want to do something about uh, black holes or something, but that's a <laughs> right. I think that is might be means the next session is actually uh, education or the future of education. Uh, the element is uh, the fundamental part of education it doesn't have to be a traditional approach. It can be this immersive approach. We know things intuitively as we are means the evolution brought us to understand the things of what we know. This is hot. This is cold. I need to run away from this cold frozen water. But we, I think, must be knowing plenty of things about this worlds of atoms and and the different uh, elements are happening. The way you're talk- talking about uh, the dilation of the field, right? The entire, the Higgs field and how we are pushing ourselves through that kind of an uh, viscous matter of the Higgs uh, field as such. And that's the nth, uh, 10 raised to 20th nth uh, 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 power of how stiffness it would be. That's, that's I, I, I am happy. I will, even though you said it's for kids, I think it will be really for adult kids. Oh yeah, I know. I, know. I, 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 I love it too. Love it too yeah. My kids means uh, Owen actually had his last shift camp at uh, the NASA's uh, Marshall Space Center uh, uh, as such, and it was this fascinating journey to go and see what humankind have achieved uh, in in the Apollo and Gemini programs. But something like that, um, maybe you should make a visit to that uh, space center and see how they are letting you immerse into the elements yeah. that the astronaut immerse. But why should not scientists immerse themselves in this world? Means so you're right. It doesn't have to be complex equations and nth level of derivations and, and trick. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just know instinctively, and then you try to. Once you, you're right. Once you develop that kind of an emotional connection to like. That's fascinating. Now I want to go to school and do a PhD in physics and understand what makes it happen. That would be an amazing way to, I would say, uh, curate and mold uh, the right. life of the next generation of kids. I am. Yeah. You should do this. I don't know. Because how. the barrier, the yeah, because the barrier, the barriers to play are are for most people low, low, right? So if any of us, adults included, is like, let's want to play, I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll play. And it's just like, do you want to work? Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to do some, uh, you know, differential equations? People are like, uh, I don't know if I want to do differential equations today, but you want to play? Of course, I want to play, right? And so that's the that's the best challenge. And I think also you brought up mentioned dark matter and dark energy, and I think those are great examples of just how ignorant we are that we don't know, you know, on the order of 70% of, of mass and energy, we have no idea what it is. So we just call it dark, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, maybe not the best word to use in my opinion, but it, the fact that we just, so we need a lot of people thinking about understanding that because we know a vast minority of our, what, what makes, up the, makes up the universe. And so we need a lot of people thinking about that. Right. Um, to figure out, figure out what that is, right? And, and so, yeah, you mentioned about yeah. gravity. It means, uh, it means just I think uh, behind me you can see uh, uh, the model uh, of the one of the most powerful rockets ever built 
uh, on on this earth uh, as the Saturn V rocket, uh, the I would say the maximum payload, the biggest payload, uh, and the uh, the biggest still to reach the operational stage uh, of of any country as such. But that's that's a three stage. Uh, I hope you remember everything. A three stage uh, liquid accelerant, uh, human expendable, uh, no expendable human rated uh, rocket launch vehicle. But the thing is, it, the entire I hope it's it's seen a little. Yeah. Bit. Because yeah. of it, only the small part over there is, I would say, we know where the uh, human sat, only three of them. But the maximum part of it is just fuel for us to burst out of the gravitational force of Earth. But the, but the other element is, I'm lifting a coffee cup right now against the same gravitational force. So the, you're right, it is so counterintuitive for, an, for a mature brain like me to see like, I want to still escape the same gravity. I want to use this mega ton fuel, but I can still lift a spoon or lift a coffee cup in the same gravity of Mother Earth. So gravity itself, in a way, it depends on who is, I would say, partaking it and what you want to do to escape our, uh, our kind of, let's say, escape velocity. Yes, but it's, it's, it's fascinating, I hope. Uh, either yeah. you or Hyundai or some <laughs> institution brings it forward and that will be, and it can be a form of a virtual augmented kind of a playground. Uh, yeah, but that will be that will be. Hopefully, you are doing this and bringing it to the world in the in the near future. Yeah, that the first thing I I can share is that my my first thing I wanted to try to show because there's been a lot of talks about black holes already, uh, you know, movies and, and and that sort of thing. But the wormhole idea is is fascinating to me. It's still very theoretical. There's no nobody's discovered a wormhole yet, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but I I think that one because it's very visual. Right, and a black hole is black, you can't see it. But a wormhole is something that light, light and information can go, in, go through, right? And so that one I, is something I'm trying to think about how to create a wormhole as they would appear in our world <clears throat> and have people experience uh, at least seeing it. I, I think it's be very difficult to have them travel through the wormhole, but I think visually, because we were able to do it in the movie, I, I, that then tells me we could probably do it in, in, in our real physica physicality of, of what a wormhole can look like visually, right? Um, and so that's what I'm thinking about right now uh, to, to do that. And so basically what, uh, what I'm thinking about right now is making a, a 3D, you need, you need a spherical projection, right? So if you're able to make a 3D proje projection onto, onto a surface, then you should be able to make, I think, simulate the visual effects of a, of a wormhole. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think just, I'm just imagining a big warehouse, I mean, one of the <laughs> the wormhole, uh, the other element uh, is pretty interesting about trying to imagine or visualize or actually materialize a 3D hole into a space that itself could be an amazing way to <laughs> yeah, see right. how we can, I mean, it is so counterintuitive. I mean, even right now, uh, even though we both might be uh, readers of this, thinking about uh, the string theory or thinking about the other dimensions of where it can be. Like we are right now so immersed in the world of 3D for us to think about the fourth dimension, not the time, the real fourth dimension uh, is pretty, pretty difficult. Uh, just as <laughs> for people in the 2D to think about 3D. Uh, but talking about even just the slices, uh, I would say, uh, uh, I would say the multiverse concept I mean, earlier, uh, and I know we are at the end of time, I have so many things to ask. Earlier, we always thought this is the universe, right? Whatever we see, observable, observable or not, that's the universe. But then we as a community, not we, the scientist community understood like, okay, what we are seeing is just one part of the universe. There is multi-universe. I thought, why would you state, why would you call it multi-universe? Uh, call something else in between. But the element is, this universe is privy to the only laws of physics that we know so the other uh, universe bubble might be a completely different universe where the laws of physics will be different where you and me might not exist or exist in a completely different form even that would be a good part of your uh, i would say uh, gravitational playground where gravity we know is let's say only in this universe what would be the other fascinate i would say facets of gravity in its own kind of an attributes uh, as for string theory and i think uh, Brian, uh would help you uh, tell more about the string theory but that will be interesting to go and see and that we can if you can somehow uh, forcefully 
let the body feel uh, those elements of other laws of physics, which sounds pretty deadly, but need not be. It can be fun too, right? Means right now, yeah. right, I go on to a museum and check my weight on moon. And right now, means I need to check my weight. How I am on moon. <laughs> adding a few pounds here and there but we saw this small kind of an elements when we were young right means you go to a museum my my mate on moon is this my mate yeah. but the elements of how you're saying is how to ex- have people experience the wormhole or the black hole uh, effects of it that will be i'm if, if you have my vote uh, <laughs> do this okay. uh, either over right. midwest or over yeah. in the valley and- and, and and the idea the, and, and the ideal scenario is that it can it, it can create apparatus that can be put into playgrounds broadly speaking. So this would be uh, for all communities, right? So so we we, we could do this uh, across all parts of the country, the world, demographics, neighborhoods, that sort of thing. So it's not just for the few, or even you know people can go to the museum, but but. This is ideal, right? and then I don't know how this would work out, but that would be my dream, right? That that we could um, make it just like a, like a swing set, right? You can put a swing set almost anywhere, right? It's, it's, so that that would be that would be perfect if we, if we could do that. That would be a great thing to do. I, I think right? we should definitely do this. I think, uh, yeah. but right now the immediate takeaway for me would be uh, maybe have a park nearby. It has all the swing sets and the theater daughter uh, and all those things. <laughs> I think, uh, even though I get a ticket for uh, vandalism, I'm okay with that. But I will print uh, the things about about physics and just paste it over there because people are actually see it happen, and it doesn't have a it doesn't have a uh, it just needs to add a little bit explanation of what you are what you are experiencing, right? Means right, right. It must be a small placard, means yeah, people can throw it away. But that's the first thing I can do. I can I, I can literally take the permission of our county and actually add that. But that's we already have the apparatus outside. People are experiencing yeah. the swing sets. Even if we, uh, you should start a small, small, small business. We can just print things. Yeah, which, right. In a good way, uh, can we stand the UV lighting and all those things, and just erect them on all the playgrounds as a part yeah. of the service. And kids are kids. They are. They are curious. They, if they are playing there, they will yeah. read it and they will explain yeah. it to each other in their own lingo. The way I can tell uh, things to my nine-year-old is different, but sometimes I cannot tell that to my seven-year-old. He breaks it down to her in their own kind of a lingo. I said, like, oh, this is you. you, but maybe we can this, uh, this science campaign of how people are already learning and they do not know they are learning. Maybe they would not like to play on the playground, but that's not good. <laughs> I think right. uh, it's just a sad thing, and I, I know this is always going to happen with each and every speaker. Uh, we are uh, literally at the top of the hour, uh, and we did not even get to go to the questions as such. Uh, but I think uh, how you have explained uh, the things about uh, what matters, uh, how we have to keep on thinking, that's pretty interesting. At least I, at least I owe you one question. Uh, how did you uh, get a project like one with Jonathan Keats, you said, means how, how do you get started with working with somebody? Oh. Your yeah, team. yeah. It was they uh, every every year they have a new cohort of, of, of uh, artists, and we have a chance to meet all of them and get to hear what we're doing, what they're doing, and and um, if, if we can offer. I mean, just listening is the one thing, and then offering any kind of support or, or ideas if, if they have any, uh, if we would have anything. Uh, but with Jonathan, um, he he said specifically he was thinking about doing something. In a car or with a car, uh, and that that got me interested. And, and then um, it was very easy to connect. He, you know, he's in based in San Francisco, so that made it easy for me to uh, to to meet with him and so on. So over brainstorming, and I was able to pull in an engineer, also part time working together. We had a little bit of small play money, right, uh, to do to do it, and then um, got to a point where we. <laughs> We weren't. We didn't tell anybody at Hyundai we were doing this, and then we said, "Oh, uh, we're doing. We did this, and we're going to do this thing at, at LACMA. And then, and then they got involved and put together really nice, uh, you know, stuff together. Uh, they, 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 you know, loaned him a car and that sort of thing. Because we were, I think we were borrowing a car from a dealer. I think <laughs> the first time. And then uh, after we said we're going to go public with this, then they, then they came in to help. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so I still talk with Jonathan actually uh, about about stuff that we could do together. 
I'm so I'm so happy you you brought this element of art and technology together, especially typically art plus technology topics are always brought by by designers like us, and we always pitch about art. It was amazing to see a a Stanford doctor of of engineering pitching <laughs> art. So uh, in the highest level, you are right. The visualizations of actual data and how we visualize that is finally art. And if you find an emotional connection, you tend to learn more about it. Uh, so I I hope you. Uh, somehow push this kind of an element of art and technology forward and I do not know this you should you should stand up for election or something and put an uh, art uh, technology kind of and seat uh, uh, at the federal state or at least at the at the state level too yeah. interesting. you have right. okay I, I think <laughs> we, we, we somehow need to uh, wrap this up uh, but as I'm going to uh, I'm asking you this question last question uh, to every speaker uh, any, apart from uh, art and technology, or let's say apart from uh, uh, black holes or dark matter or gravity, you are at a fascinating level. Uh, you are doing some amazing things, technical. Uh, you're a good person. Uh, it's great to have you, not only just as a client, but great to have you as a part of this kind of, and I would say, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, innovator mindset of people we want to have right now, keep on probing different areas to bring them to surface. If you want to share some of the things that made you who you are with some of our, let's say, younger uh, audience members, what, what, what can be your advice to them and how to look at things? Means you are amazingly curious and you make things happen, not just keep it at the curiosity level. You want to share something of what made yeah. you? Yeah. Um, I think over the years, um, even when you're younger, you kind of have an understanding of the things that, that uh, interest you, that you find... Um, um, you know, just things that you can easily do. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a strong signal or, or, or a cue or a clue to, to what, um, you know, can, can drive you, right? And I, I think it's, uh, it, it does, you know, you, it, especially those things that are not necessarily mainstream or you're not necessarily finding outlets for, um, in, in the beginning, it, you know, it, this can take, I don't know, it could take years. And it's actually, honestly, this whole art and technology thing, you know, only, only happened in the last few years, even, even for me. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's valuable. I, I suppose every, every, every part that, that you, uh, even though it may find to be not common or other people doing it, it's okay. I think you can find it common. I think my, my, if I could distill it down into a statement would be that, and I really believe this, that we're all unique. Uh, we're all uniquely made and that uh, we're all one of a kind of original. And so there, there's something that, um, um, it's not about being smart or, or strong, it's just, it's about the uniqueness that we all have and that kind of understanding what that is. And then, um, hopefully, if, hopefully you have a chance to express it, you know, somehow. And even if, you, even if it's not expressed in terms of uh, monetary reward, um, it's something to, to appreciate and enjoy about yourself, right? And I think this is how we can enjoy the world wherever, whether pandemic or no, no pandemic, it's how we can find, uh, you know, some some peace and satisfaction in this otherwise crazy world. Oh, awesome! That's that's pretty nice kind of a summarization, and it is a crazy world right now as we know out there. So, uh, yeah. thank you again for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule, and we love to yeah. you and we'll keep on working. And someday we should work on this gravity. Yeah, we should. We should. I, I, I like that. If you have to do any super user or a design resource, I'm. I'm really Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, feel free to uh, keep on uh, logged in if you want. Uh, if you want to just unmute okay. or unmute. Thank you again. Thank you, Jivak. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Take care. Yeah, bye. Awesome. Uh, guys and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, Mr. John himself, uh, all the way from the Silicon Valley all the sunny, uh, warm uh, elements of Silicon Valley. By the way, just to make you, you know, feel great, John, right now it is raining outside and it's pretty gloomy, it's pretty dark out there, but I think uh, we are still enjoying uh, the different elements from, from uh, different uh, parts of the world and different uh, diversity uh, from the topics itself too.